My name is Mary Ann Lieb, and I am the president of the Alpha Nu chapter of Sigma Theta Tau International, which is co-sponsoring today's research symposium. Before I introduce the next speaker, I would like to tell you a little bit about Sigma Theta Tau International. Sigma Theta Tau is the honor society for nurses which recognizes nurses for scholarship, excellence, and leadership. Villanova's chapter is Alpha Nu, and it celebrated its 50th anniversary last year. And the chapter is vibrant and productive. I invite those of you who are students to consider applying for membership, and those of you who are already nurses to apply as nurse leaders. Please review the criteria and complete an application which can be found on the College of Nursing homepage under Nursing Organizations. The deadline for applications is May 1, 2017. And now I am pleased to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Suzanne C. Smeltzer is Professor and Director, Center for Nursing Research at Villanova University College of Nursing. She has conducted research related to disability, health issues of people with disability, including pregnancy, and education of healthcare professionals, including nurses, to provide quality health care to people with disabilities. Dr. Smeltzer has received numerous awards related to her research and scholarship, including the 2016 Nurse.com Gannett Foundation Lectureship Award for Diversity, Inclusion, and Sustainability in Nursing Education from the Association of College of Nursing, AACN. She and her faculty colleagues have developed a new addition to the National League for Nursing's Advancing Care Excellence Program that addresses disability with the goal of providing nursing faculty across the country with teaching strategies and materials to prepare nursing students to provide quality care to individuals with disabilities. She has published her research widely in nursing and non-nursing journals alike and given over 200 presentations to disseminate information about health issues of people with disabilities and lack of disability in healthcare curricula. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Suzanne Smeltzer, who will speak on experiences of women with disabilities about perinatal care and recommendations for clinicians. Dr. Smeltzer. I'm going to switch to my other hat for just a second. One of the people that I did not recognize when I was going through the list of people who are committee members is Sharon Roth DeFovio, who is the person who is our tech support, and we simply could not do this without her. She's way in the back and waving. Thank you, Sharon. OK. Uh, I'm not going to repeat the title, because Marianne just said it to you, and it's up here on the slide. Uh, this research has been conducted by a team, a um, team of collaborators and um, colleagues. Uh, myself, Monica Mitra, uh, Lisa Iazzoni, Linda long and Lauren Smith. And as you, I've tried to color match the little, um, the number with their institutions. Um, many of these people are from the Boston area, um, and I think I'm the only one who isn't, come to think of it. Um, this work has been funded by a grant from the National Institutes of Health, the Eunice Kennedy Schreiber National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. A little bit of background. There are over uh, uh, 165,000 women with physical disabilities in the United States who become pregnant every year. More than 44,000 of them have what would probably be termed severe disabilities. The number of women with disabilities, particularly physical disabilities, becoming pregnant each year is increasing. Historically, women with disabilities were discouraged from considering pregnancy 
and met with very negative reactions if they did so. I have to add that unfortunately, some of them are still experiencing those negative reactions, not just from healthcare providers, but from family members and from perfect strangers as well. These negative reactions, barriers, and experiences continue despite the progress that has been made since the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in the year um, 1990. So it's been 27 years ago. Some of these negative experiences are identified in, on this slide. Inaccessible healthcare settings, even though there's a law that says they have to be accessible. This includes hospital rooms, clinical offices, Many facilities have no adjustable exam tables and weight scales. Since I'm talking about pregnancy, now is the, point, the time to make the point that many women with physical disabilities go throughout an entire pregnancy without ever being weighed. And if you think about how important weight is as a method of monitoring the progress and the status of women without disabilities, how can it no longer be important for women with disabilities? but they go for, not only during pregnancy, but oftentimes for decades without ever being weighed. There is a lack of information about the interaction of disability and pregnancy. This affects not only healthcare providers, but also affects the women themselves. They seek information, there's not much information out there for them. They have also encountered insensitive healthcare clinicians who lack knowledge about the perinatal needs and um, sort of blow off their uh, concerns and their, their questions. So the purpose of this particular study is to examine the perinatal experiences of women with physical disabilities and to identify their recommendations for obstetric care clinicians to improve care. You might ask, well, who am I talking about when I'm talking about obstetric care clinicians? I'm talking about OBGYNs, I'm talking about nurse midwives, I'm talking about nurse practitioners, and I'm also talking about nurses who have uh, interaction with pregnant women during pregnancy. Women with disabilities during pregnancy. I think I just said pregnant women during pregnancy. This, <coughs> this particular study is part of a larger mixed method study that addressed the unmet healthcare needs of women with physical disabilities and their barriers to care. So there's a major part of the study, which is a quantitative study, and then a qualitative uh, descriptive component as well. Inclusion criteria are identified here. Women with disabilities who have uh, limited ability to walk without some sort of assistance or to use their arms or hands. The disability had to be present during pregnancy and when they were participating in the study. They needed to have delivered a live infant within the last 10 years. We originally had this at five years and we didn't get a very good response, so we broadened with the IRB approval, broadened that to 10 years. They needed to be between the ages of 21 and 55 at the time of the study and willing and able to participate in the study and in telephone interviews. We had IRB approval from four universities, from the four universities of the four investigators. Women were recruited through social media sites as well as disability organizations. They were asked on the flyer that was posted to the sites to contact the research coordinator if they were interested in participating. They received a consent form by email if they were interested and met the criteria and then they were scheduled for telephone interviews. Informed consent was reviewed verbally and verbal consent was obtained at the start of the interview. The women were interviewed by one of two of the investigators, both of whom have physical disabilities. The interview guide that we used, and it was quite extensive because this is only a piece of the, the greater study that we did, even the, even the qualitative component. The interview guide was developed by the research team based on our experiences, individual as well as collective, and the results of our previous studies. So the focus of this particular aspect of this, the bigger study is on the interactions of women with physical disabilities with their clinicians during pregnancy and their recommendations for clinicians to improve perinatal care for women with disabilities. These interviews took around two hours. They were conducted in English, audio taped, and transcribed by pro professional transcription service. After the transcriptions were verified, by listening to the, um, to the interviews and looking at the transcripts, um, traditional content analysis was used in analysis. 
An iterative process was used. That means we re read the transcripts, identified important points, did some coding, read them again, did some more coding, read them again, so you get the picture. We did use Atlas, um, a software program uh, to assist in data analysis. 31 women responded to the invitation to participate, only 20, not only 25, but 25 of them participated in the telephone call. The mean age was 31.8 at the time of um, the birth of their youngest child. 15 of the pregnancies were planned, 10 were not. Even if they were not, they were extremely happy that they were pregnant. Um, the disabling condition, as you can see from the slide, was very diverse. I'm not going to list all of those, but they range from dwarfism to cerebral palsy to spinal cord injury to MS. 18 of the, the women used some form of ambulation or wheeled mobility aids. The resulting themes that came from the study include the three that are identified here. And I'm not going to read them now because the next couple of slides address each one of these in turn. So the first theme was clinicians' lack of knowledge about pregnancy-related needs of women with physical disabilities. The women said that their healthcare providers lacked knowledge about the interaction of disability and pregnancy. Again, these are obstetric clinicians in one category or the other including the effect of the disability during pregnancy, labor, and, and birth. They would ask questions and the healthcare provider would have no answer to them. They felt as though they were seen as problems. They viewed clinicians' bias and negative reactions, which they reported, as due to their clinicians' lack of knowledge about perinatal needs of women with disabilities. So here's an example. There was just a lack of understanding, and I think there was also a lack of understanding because I happened to have a disability. That did not mean that I was not perfectly normal, for lack of a better word. Their recommendations based on this knowledge gap was to acknowledge, for clinicians to acknowledge their own lack of knowledge about the issues, but a willingness to learn. They suggested that clinicians research the topic if knowledge is lacking, to consult with other clinicians involved in the women's care, to conduct, consult rather, websites of disability specific organizations such as the United CP Association, Little People of America, Osteogenesis Imperfecta. These websites have a, a tremendous amount of information and very often there's information there related to pregnancy for women with those kinds of disabilities. And the clinicians rarely, if ever, consulted those. The second theme was clinicians' failure to consider knowledge, experience, and expertise of women with disabilities about their own disabilities. Women's um, experiences were often ignored or discounted, even if they have had that disability from the day they were born. Clinicians often asked, failed to ask women about their disability and ignored their attempts to share information with them. Some examples. Every time I talked, every, everything I said to him, he blew me off. And I said, you know, I'm an expert on my body. I know what's normal and not. This advice on the second one is really more to women, and that is you need to make sure, especially when you have some experience with a condition, that they take what you say seriously and that they don't assume that you have no cognitive ability because you have a disability. <coughs> So their recommendations to healthcare providers are to treat women with the same respect and care that they give to other women. And if you really <coughs> want to know about how things affect me, ask me. Don't assume that women with physical disability have cognitive, uh, uh, have no co uh, cognitive ability just because they have a disability. And then the third and last theme was clinicians' lack of awareness of the reproductive concerns of women with disabilities, physical disabilities. The women reported that they get the message from clinicians that they cannot, or perhaps should not, become pregnant and have children because they have a disability. The lack of awareness that women with disabilities have the same right and the same desire as other women to have children. And it's very strong in many women. A couple of examples. He literally told me that I needed to remain abstinent. Another one, look how disabled you are, and you really shouldn't be. You should not get pregnant. And there's another one that I think um, is kind of telling. And this is what another one said. Her, she reported that her clinician said to her, if I were your parents, 
I would do everything in my power to encourage you to adopt rather than to have a baby of your own. And my response is, parents? These are adult women. Why would you talk about their parents? You certainly wouldn't do that if it was not a person with a disability. The recommendations of the women related to these issues or you know, this, these themes that I just, uh, or this last theme, are to set aside personal biases, prejudices, and personal views. They stated fairly clearly that if, they, if the women asked for recommendations about pregnancy, then share them. But don't keep your biases and your opinions and your personal judgments and let that enter the discussion. Keep those to yourself because they are not welcome. Treat women with physical disabilities the same as any other woman seeking pregnancy-related care. So in terms of where we are, 27 years after the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, women with physical disabilities still experience multiple barriers, biases, prejudices, and stereotyping by obstetric clinicians. The experiences of the women in this study and the recommendations that they gave reflect the continuing gaps in perinatal health care for women with diverse disabilities. The findings, including the recommendations that they gave, reflect the importance of interactions between women with disabilities and their clinicians. The clinician's lack of knowledge reflects continuing and continued failure of health professions education to address the topic of disability in curricula. It is simply not there in most health professions. And the issue is that women with physical disabilities are likely at increased risk for poor outcomes because of inadequate perinatal care resulting from inadequate knowledge on the part of health care providers. There are, of course, limitations to this study as there are to almost every other study there is. <coughs> Excuse me, one of them is the inability to generalize the findings because of the design of the study. But of interest, the qualitative findings mirror those of the quantitative portion of this study. The responses may not reflect those of women who did not respond to the invitation to participate and may not have had access to the internet or to the social media that were used. And although diverse, the sample did not include women with all possible types of physical disabilities, although it was, as I say, a pretty diverse population. So in terms of summary and conclusion, there is a continuing need to address the perinatal needs of women with other types of disabilities through research. We need to continue to address the topic or the failure of the health professions to incorporate disability in educational curricula. Although the ADA is 27 years old, issues remain and need to be addressed as more women with disabilities choose to become pregnant and they are doing exactly that. Here are just a couple of examples. Um, on your left is a woman who is a clinical psychologist. Um, and as you can see, she looks very happy looking down on her pregnant um, abdomen. Um, she is a woman who is, was born without two legs, either leg, and part of one arm. And she's a clinical psychologist and wrote about her experience in the APA, uh, American Psychological Association newsletter, so you can read about her whole story if you're interested. And on the other side is a young woman with a physical disability. So I have um, maybe time for questions, if there are any. Yes. <laughs> That's a very good question. The question was, did any of the women have anything positive to say? Um, some of the women had some positive things to say. Um, in, in those cases in which women had a, 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 um, an obstetric provider or interaction with somebody, you know, on the healthcare team who did listen to them and did provide answers and that kind of thing, they reported that. Um, so not everybody had a negative experience, but almost every single person with a disability has had negative experiences. Yes. Okay, that's a very good question too. The, did we have an opportunity to talk to any providers um, to ask about why this, you know, why the negative experiences? 
I'm involved in two studies at the same time. One of them is this study. There's another study um, in which we did, no, actually, that's the study, sorry, um, in which we interviewed some clinicians, obstetric clinicians, so in this case, they were obstetricians and a nurse midwife, about, and these are people who were known to do a good job in caring for women with, with disabilities. And to the person, every single person indicated that they had never received any education or training about caring for people with disabilities, and they wish they had. So they, they have said that would be a really good idea. Um, the, one of the questions that I asked in, in the interviews, because I conducted those interviews, I asked the question of these clinicians, um, is there anything, you know, do you have a particularly memorable positive experience that you could report and a particularly negative one? And without any further prompting, at least six of those clinicians immediately said, it's the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life. You know, that it, re it really was the epitome of what medicine should be, you know, from an obstetric standpoint. And the, the thing that we're trying very, very hard to do is to get that out into the literature so that other people, you know, might consider caring for people with disabilities because it is so rewarding. Um, and the descriptions of the clinicians was incredibly positive. Why don't they provide care? It's because they haven't been educated, just as most nurses have not been educated to care for people with disabilities. And of course, that's one of the things we're trying to change and, you know, here at Villanova and in, in other venues as well. That's a good question. Other, other questions or comments? Vanessa. Were the women pleased that we were doing this research? Oh yeah. <laughs> they are because, you know, lots of times nobody's ever asked them about what their experience has been like. Uh, that actually raises the other side of the coin and that is, well, what about the women whose experiences have been so incredibly positive, you know, that they decided not to, you know, participate? That's a relatively small number, I think, because again, this is pervasive you know, in the, um, in the healthcare system and in medical education, nursing education, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so that people don't know. You know, it's not that they don't want to, they just don't know how to, you know, address these issues. Um, Lynn. Yes. The, the question, as, as I heard it, did we collect information on the type of delivery they had and did that have any impact, uh, I guess, on what the women said? Um, the, the occurrence of cesarean se section in this group was much higher than it is in you know, other populations, um, but I don't believe that that made a difference in terms of women's reactions or women's experiences. What made a difference was what they went into delivery thinking they were, or into labor thinking they were gonna have, and then what they actually had. In some cases, they, they reported that their, the decision was made without informing them or asking them. You know, so somebody's saying, okay, we're gonna do a C-section, and that wasn't what they had in mind. Um, so that was one of the things that resulted in you know, negative responses. There's another hand in that same row, Marianne. I, okay, repeat your question if you can one more time because I want to make sure I have it when I repeat it. Would it be worthwhile interviewing women with positive experiences? Well, we did have some women in here in the study who did have positive experiences, and they, and they told us, you know, what would make a difference, and that is if the healthcare provider listens to them, um, you know, things of that sort. So I think we have a pretty good idea about what would make a difference. The, the issue is getting clinicians to realize that they don't know and to want to change their practice. And they don't have any role models out there because everybody else is doing it the same way. You know, so that goes back to um, Dr. Henson's idea about role modeling behaviors, and that's what we need. 
but it's difficult to get them because nobody's had the education and the training, you know, from the from the healthcare profession. And there was one last question. Yeah. Okay. Did we find that there was a difference in terms of um, experiences with women with different types of disabilities? No, but we really couldn't compare because of the nature of the study. It was a qualitative study rather than where you could actually make comparisons. But in general, there was no difference. They, women across the, across the spectrum of disability, and again, these were women with physical disability as opposed to other kinds of disability. Um, their concerns and their experiences were pretty, pretty similar across disability types. Okay, if there are no other questions, um, one, one last one, yes. Well, that actually is one of the recommendations from the women is that if you, if you don't know, acknowledge it and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something in order to increase my knowledge. But, you know, one of the things that they said at the, you know, after all of this discussion was, ask me, ask me, because I know about how my body works and I know, you know, what my issues are. And that's not something that a lot of healthcare professionals do, you know, is to ask the individual who is affected. And that's a really important.